Ah. All right, we're going to start again. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so now we should actually have volume. Um, shall not covet your neighbor's yeah, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his cattle or anything that is his. These two commandments are given quite exclusively to the Jewish people. Nevertheless, in part, they also apply to us, for they do not interpret them as referring to unchastity or theft. They are forbidden well enough above. They also thought that they had kept all these commandments when they had done or not done the external act. Therefore, God has added these two commandments in order that it be considered sinful and forbidden to desire or in any way to aim at getting our neighbor's wife or possessions. He added them especially because under Jewish government, manservants and maidservants were not free, as now, to serve for wages as long as they pleased. Jewish servants were their master's property and their property uh, with their body and all that they had, as were cattle and other possessions. Furthermore, every man had power over his wife to put her away publicly by giving her a bill of divorce to take another. Therefore, they were in constant danger among each other. If one took a fancy to another's wife, he might declare any reason both to dismiss his own wife and to estrange his neighbor's wife from him, so that he might get her in a way that appeared right. That was not considered a sin or a disgrace among them, just as it is hardly considered a sin now with hired help when an owner dismisses his manservant or maidservant or takes another's servant away from him in any way. All right, so um, the ninth and 10th commandments both deal with kind of an abstract concept, don't they? Coveting. And um, I, I hear actually, I hear this kind of reasoning even today from some Jewish thinkers. Um, uh, who was that? Um, oh, I'm going to go blank on who it was. Pr pretty well known Jewish uh, uh, thinker that uh, was advocating for, who were saying basically, it's, it's not a big deal if men look at uh, pornographic magazines as long as they're not acting the, those things out because it's only the action that matters, not what goes on in the mind. Well, <laughs> uh, this is, first of all, contrary to Scripture, um, contrary to the Ninth and Tenth Commandments. So even without going to the New Testament, you have that forbidden. Uh, but also, um, it's, you know, where does sin begin? In the heart, in the mind, right? With lusts, with desires, and then somebody acts on those. Um, but even the lust is a sin in and of itself. Um, and that's a big difference between how we view these things and how some uh, some of the Jewish uh, thinkers ha uh, throughout history have, have viewed this. Um, you know, what we have in our minds matters. And when there's sin in your mind, when there's sin in your heart, well, <laughs> here's, here's the thing. If, if, if there's if there's no way of dealing with that sin, really, then we try to minimize it. But as Christians, we should not minimize it, should we? Let sin be sin. If God calls something sin, we should not try to find a way out from around that. We should say, Lord, I've sinned, right? Because what do we do with sin? We confess it and we receive forgiveness. Uh, so we're not so concerned with, oh, but it's going to make, it's, 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 not, it's another sin on my tally. Yeah, we know. And calling it something else isn't going to change that fact either. Um, yeah, let, let um, 
you know, let sin be what it is. Let God's law be strong because the Savior is even stronger. Yep. Uh, going off of the theme, it's, it's interesting that you would say that because there are people that even technically have exactly what it takes to deal with sin. For instance, I'll give you, I'll give, and, and, yet, and yet minimize it. Mm-hmm. For, for instance, I had a conversation with a college friend from, of mine a little while back. It was about sins of, sins of, sins of thought. And, and he's, a, he's a Catholic priest, so he went to Ohio Dominican. He's, he's now a, a, a full-blown ordained Catholic, Catholic priest. And I asked him, well, if I went to you for confession, mm-hmm. and I confessed fleeting thoughts of some sort or another, he'd say, well, I'd say you wouldn't have to confess that. It's only if you dwell on them that it winds up becoming a. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and uh, that's not what Scripture says, is it? Um, so again, it's it's a way of trying to minimize that sin. Um, but this goes, it all goes back to justification. All goes back to Jesus, right? So if Jesus really is the Savior, who died for all sins of all time, all people, and justification really is by grace through faith. Well, then we have nothing to fear by calling something sin. We just recognize, okay, that's what that is. Now, what do I do with it? Well, I, I take it to Jesus. I, I don't have to be afraid of it. Uh, I know what to do with it. I, I go to Jesus, and he, he's got that taken care of. Uh, but when I, when I minimize it, what happens? I start excusing sin. I start not confessing sin as what it is. And over time, that can grow and develop and fester. Um, and, and so, you know, when you get justification right, we, we don't have anything to fear from this. When we get justification wrong, that's when you start minimizing. Oh, well, no, that's not really a sin, because that if it were a sin, then that would be something that everybody struggles with. And so that can't rightly be called sin. Could it be? Yeah. <laughs> That's the human condition. That's the sinful nature that we have. It can be a venial sin. Oh, yeah. Well, <sighs> let's move on. Okay. 296. In this way, they interpreted those, the, these commandments and that, that rightly, although the scope of their commandment teaches somewhat further and higher, and no one should consider or intend to get what belongs to another, such as his wife, servants, house, and estate, land, meadows, cattle. He should not take them even with a show of right or by trick or by his neighbor's harm or to his neighbor's harm. For above in the seventh commandment, the vice is forbidden where one takes for himself the possessions of another or withholds from them from his neighbor. A person cannot rightly do these things. But here it is also forbidden for you to alienate anything from your neighbor. Even though you could do so with honor in the eyes of the world. So that one could accuse, no one could accuse uh, or blame you as though you had gotten it wrongfully. I think about Abraham with Lot. I remember when Lot gets taken, he gets kidnapped. He and his whole clan, they get kidnapped uh, and all their stuff taken. And what happens? Abraham, keeping the fifth commandment, goes and defends Lot um, and, and takes his man and, and sets him free. And then afterwards, he restores all of the possessions back to Lot. Now, Nobody would have thought anything bad of Abraham if at that point he would have said, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a portion of that because without me, you wouldn't have had it. You know, in earthly terms, everyone would have gone, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, he, he's, he's pretty generous to give him back anything. <laughs> uh, but Abraham gives it all back because it's not his. It's his neighbor's. And he restored back to his neighbor what rightfully belonged to him. He didn't covet it. He didn't get it by a show of right. He says, no, I, I served my neighbor. And my neighbor needs to have restored back to him what belongs to him. 
All right, 297 for our natural instinct is that no one wants to see someone else have as much as himself. Each one acquires as much as he can. The other may do as best he can, yet we pretend to be godly, know how to dress ourselves up most finely and conceal our base character. We resort to and invent tricky ways and deceitful works like those that are now daily and most ingeniously uh, invented. We act as though these ways were derived from the legal codes in fact, we even dare properly to refer to the law and boast about it. We will not have this called trickery, but shrewdness and caution. Lawyers and jurists assist in this who twist and stretch the law to suit it to their cause. They stress words and use them for a trick, despise fairness or their neighbor's need. In short, Whoever is the most expert and cunning in these affairs finds the most help in the law. And they themselves say, the law favors the watchful. All right, so <laughs> this is all dealing with what? Getting things by a show of right, appearing to do things in a, a way that is legal and lawful, but really, you're just, you're breaking God's law even if you're abiding by the civil law. And for us, which comes first? It's always God's law. You know, the civil law, if it's contrary to God's law, well, we, we, we're not going to really care about what it says. Uh, we're going to follow God's law. Uh, but I think that, that first sentence there, for our natural instinct is that no one wants to see someone else have as much as himself. Isn't that true? I mean, <laughs> we, should, we should be ashamed of that, but that's our natural instinct that we say, oh, well, I don't, want to have, I don't want that guy to have more than I have. I would, I'd rather I have more than he has, right? Uh, you need this, yeah. <laughs> you want to show that as an object lesson for I do. the camera? I do. I need the uh, object lesson for the camera here. Yeah. So... Speaking of coveting here, we have the, the bag of, of chips here. You need this. <laughs> it's inviting you to covet. Wonderful. Oh. <laughs> oh, did you just steal from your neighbor? Oh, all right. 300. The, this last commandment, therefore, is not given for... Uh, cheaters in the eyes of the world. It is for the most pious who want to be praised and to be called honest and upright people. For they have not offended against the former commandments, as especially the Jewish people claimed to live, and are even now many great noblemen and gentlemen and princes, for the other common masses belong yet further down under the seventh commandment, as people who hardly are, are, are hardly concerned about whether they gain their possessions with right and honor. Now, this happens most often in cases that are brought into court, where it is the purpose to get something from our neighbor and force him from his property. For example... When people quarrel and wrangle about a large inheritance, real estate, or such, they help themselves and resort to whatever appears right. They dress and adorn everything so that the law must favor their side. They keep the property with such title that no one can complain or lay claim to it. In the same way, if anyone wants to have a castle, city, duchy, or other great thing, he makes many financial deals through relationships by any means he can so that the owner is legally deprived of the property. It is awarded to the other person and confirmed with deed and seal and declared to have been acquired by princely title and honesty. So, again, we can... We can wrangle things in such a way that it appears 
that we're in the right. All the while, really, stealing. Right? Okay. In common trade, one carefully slips something out of another's hand so that the latter must watch out. Or one person surprises and cheats another in a matter where he sees advantage and benefit for himself. Then the person who was cheated, perhaps on account of distress or debt, cannot regain or redeem the property without damage. The other person gains the half or even more. Yet this property must not be considered as taken by fraud or stolen, but honestly bought. Here they say, first come, first served, and everyone must look out to his own interests. Let another person, or let another get what he can. Who can be so smart to come up with all these ways in which one can get many things into his possession by such believable arguments? The world does not consider this wrong and will not notice that the neighbor is placed at a disadvantage by this by sacrificing what he cannot spare without harm. Yet no one wishes for someone to do this to himself. For uh, from this, we can easily see that such devices and arguments are false. Uh, so underlying this is the great commandment, right? Love God and love your neighbor. Now, if you are doing something that you, are, you know is going to harm your neighbor simply to enrich yourself, you're not keeping the commandment. All right. Yep. So this is a this is a case. What you described there is, is a case where the um, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're completely at odds for it, where the law of the land does conflict with the law of God. Um, Oftentimes, in cases, of, in cases of like intellectual property, copyright, uh, trademark, that sort of thing, uh, only the copyright holder or the trademark holder can file suit against people that go and steal it. So, so if, if, if I steal some, something that you've written and, and start publishing it or whatever, and you don't catch it, it doesn't matter if he caught it. It doesn't matter. Right, doesn't legally. Matter it legally doesn't matter at all because if you decide not to file suit against me for my stealing, then I can just straight up get away with it. Right. So that invites people to do things surreptitiously mm -hmm. so that, you know, maybe you're busy actually doing your duty and you don't have time to go safeguard after your intellectual property so you just don't right because there's some better things to do right and and were we to live according to god's law then we wouldn't have people stealing the intellectual property and using it as if it were their own um so you know this is again another example where when we live according to god's law guess what things are good uh, we are blessed. Things go better for us and for our neighbor. Uh, do you have a hand up? No, that's okay. All right. Okay. All right. 305. The same was done in former times also with respect to wives. They knew such tricks that if one were pleased with another woman, he personally or through others as the as there were many ways and means to be invented, caused her husband to become displeased with her. Or he caused, or, or he had her resist her husband and act in such a way that he was obli obliged to uh, dismiss her and let her go to the other man. That sort of thing undoubtedly prevailed much under the law, as we, were, we, we also read, uh, read in the Gospel about King Herod. He took his brother's wife while he was still living. Yet Herod wanted to be thought of as an honorable, pious man, as St. Mark also testifies about him. But such an example, I trust, will not happen among us, for in the New Testament, these who are married are forbidden to get divorced, except there is the case where one man shrewdly, by some trick, takes away a rich bride from another man. But it is not... Uh, but it is not a rare thing with us that one estranges or alienates another manservant or maidservant or lures them away with flattering words. So, um, 
maybe not uh, quite the same way as we see here, but the same thing applies, doesn't it? Um, if somebody is married, luring their wife away from them, or if you know, if you're a, if you're a woman, luring a husband away from his wife, is evil. It's wicked. What should we be doing? We should be supporting that marriage, encouraging them yeah. in that marriage, uh, helping them in their marriage. We should not be doing what we, you know, anything that would break a marriage up. Um, yep. Another case where the law of the land is basically no fault divorce. Well, mm -hmm. that's completely against. What's yeah. Yeah, and so what happens? Well, my lusts lead me to want somebody else, and so, um, you know, the 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 reason no fault divorce was not the law of the land um, until recent times, uh, it was not because of the patriarchy, <laughs> but rather it was to protect wives. It was so that husbands couldn't just say. I'm kind of tired of this one. I'm going to do away with her and, and get a new wife. Um, because women didn't have a whole lot of power to do anything about things. And, um, you know, we, we wanted families protected. We wanted wives to be able to have children, raise children, you know, uh, families to stay together. And, and so the law helped protect that. Um, you know, what, what happens when we let our hearts covet? Well, it leads to a whole bunch of divorce, doesn't it? And what happens with divorce? Who gets impacted? The kids. The kids, big time. Who else? What's that? The wife. The wife and the husband and the extended family and, 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 Right? Um, it's, uh, it, it hurts a whole lot of people and, and a, a lot of people think it's a, an easy fix, right? Th things are really, really hard. If I get divorced, then I'll be happy. And what happens? They get divorced and life's still really hard. <laughs> They're not happy. And... If, uh, and, and a lot of times uh, what happens also is, okay, now I'm going to be happy with this person until I'm not. And then I'm going to be happy with this person until I'm not, right? So it, it leads to this, this series of, of uh, actions, and it's all destructive. So we got to deal with that problem of coveting so it doesn't have all of these other consequences when we don't deal with it. Well, how do we deal with coveting? We confess it, right? Uh, yeah, we have private confession and absolution available. You can confess these things to the Lord, right? Uh, but you can come in and privately confess them to the pastor and receive that word of forgiveness. But you got to confess it to deal with it. Okay. Uh, 307, in whatever way such things happen, we must know that God does not want you to deprive your neighbor of anything that belongs to him so that he suffer the loss and you gratify your greed with it. Boy, that's a great line right there, isn't it? God does not want you to deprive your neighbor of anything that belongs to him so that he suffer the loss and you gratify your greed with it. That's at the heart of it, isn't it? That's kind of the, the bottom line. This is true even if you could honorably uh, keep it honorably uh, before the world. For it is a secret and sly trick done under the hat, as we say, so that it may not be noticed. Although you go your way as if you had done no one any wrong, you still have injured your neighbor. If it is not called stealing and cheating, it is called coveting your neighbor's property. That is, aiming at possession of it 
luring it away from him without his consent and being unwilling to see him enjoy what God granted him. And that last one, I think, is a really big one. Being unwilling to see your neighbor enjoy what God granted him. Because I want it. <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's what's behind that. I, I can't even allow, I can't even enjoy the fact that my neighbor is enjoying. His enjoyment deprives me of pleasure. <laughs> Isn't that wicked? Yes. But that's, that's kind of how our, our hearts are unless renewed by the, the Spirit. Okay, 308, even though the judge and everyone must let you keep it, God will not let you keep it, for he does not, for he sees the deceitful heart and the world's malice, which is sure to make an extra long measure wherever you yield to her a finger's breadth. Eventually, public wrong and violence follow. And that's right, isn't it? When coveting runs rampant, when people do things that only appear right, but really you're exploiting your neighbor, eventually, what, it is that, what does it end up with? It ends up with um, violence. It ends up with, with uh, chaos. 309, therefore, we allow these commandments to remain in their ordinary meaning. It is commanded first that we do not desire our neighbor's harm or even assist, nor give opportunity for it. But we must gladly wish and leave him what he has. Also, we must advance and preserve for him what may be for his property, profit and service, just as we wish to be treated. So these commandments are especially directed against envy and miserable greed. God wants to remove all causes and sources from which arises everything by which we harm our neighbor. Therefore, he expresses it in plain words, you shall not covet, and so on. For he especially wants us to have a pure heart, although we will never attain to that so long as we live here. So this commandment will remain, like the rest, one that will constantly accuse us and Show how godly we are in God's sight. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. Thoughts, questions, yeah. I, I actually, it, so uh, hypothetical scenario here. And, and I'm setting this up because there is a, there's an actual question about the complexity of life today compared to that. Okay. And they didn't have inflation as much. And then they didn't have the value of things being so much up in the air of wondering how much something is actually worth. Sure. So let's say that uh, I crash my four-wheeled horse and I require another one. Or a four-wheeled donkey. Um, and you have your four-wheeled donkey that you and I make a deal that I buy your four-wheeled donkey. Well, how do we... How do we know what their price is then? Yeah. Like, how do we know if you're if, if I'm exploiting you because you want to you, you want to be helpful to me, or if you're exploiting me because sure, you know, or, or or even if we're just we settle on a bad price because we don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I think if you settle on a bad price because you don't know, then I, I wouldn't say any sin has been committed there. Um, you know, you're just you're just ignorant. <laughs> If you settle on a bad price for one party or the other, and the other party knows full well, that's where the problem comes in, right? So if I know that I have something that is worth, you know, a hundred bucks, and you're saying, I'll give you, I, I want to buy that for a thousand dollars, and because you think it's something other than what it is, or because I know that there's something wrong with it, um, I need to I need to make that clear first. Not take advantage of you because it's the free, the, the the free market. Well, the free market is not does not give you excuse to exploit your neighbor, does it? 
um, in the same way that if I were to buy something from you and you know you knew full well the full market value was you know much greater than than what I was willing to or let's say but it, let's say I, I was going to sell something to you right and the, the value you knew the value was really really great and I thought it was just some cheap thing well you, you need to not exploit your neighbor in that uh, but you know be, be fair in that now if they still don't care then that's fine <laughs> but you know if they're doing it just out of ignorance and you're taking advantage of them that's different than well I just really want this thing out of here okay you're losing a lot on this I don't care okay fine right but you, it, it's about the the honesty and being being fair to each other, right? Being honest with each other. Yep. So, uh, coveting is bad. Coveting is bad. Coveting is bad. Uh, but it's incredibly widespread. And we have Paul telling yeah. us, I would not have known what it says to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. So mm -hmm. It's such a natural thing to it our is. sinful nature of where it's just the default. Oh, what do you mean? This is wrong. I want something that other people have. And, it, and I'm going to be able to get it. Oh, sure. Get it. sure. Yeah, coveting is, is natural to us in our fallen nature. Just as lust is, right? It doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> um, and, and it doesn't mean we should act on it. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot in our sinful nature that is natural to us um, and you know the free market economy works well because people are na naturally selfish and covetous <laughs> um, so you know the uh, uh, the, the, the pro you know the communist way of doing things were people all altruistic and perfectly um, without sin would work great people aren't <laughs> so you have to govern people as they are um, and so the the free market economy actually takes into account people's sinful nature um, and which which is one of the reasons it actually works um, that said it still doesn't excuse us as Christians when we violate the commandment but there's a free market free love anything goes <laughs> as long as there's mutual oh, consent. Oh no. Yeah. And then you gotta define what that means. And you gotta have a informed consent. Contract about that. And I thought we had a contract called marriage. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Oh goodness. Let's let's close with prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word, giving us the commandments and, and teaching us what, what sin is, um, what, it, what, what we are to do, what we are not to do, and, and revealing even the sin that is within our hearts and our minds. Uh, where we covet, uh, correct us. Bring us to, to repentance. And, and when we do have those feelings, those uh, desires of covetousness, let us bring them to you. Confess them. Receive your forgiveness and, and receive a clean heart from you so that we can go forward and, and love our neighbors and, and treat them well and treat them as you would have us, uh, to love them as uh, you would have us love them. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to continue to be uh, together, to study, uh, to encourage one another. Uh, and we pray that you would um, continue to bless our study as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen.